you heard the word Ethernet today, you'd probably think of a computer network using Category 5 cables and some switches. But that wasn't always the case, and today we're going to look at an older implementation. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and today I'm going to have a look at 10 base 2 Thin Ethernet, which is, well, an older Ethernet implementation, as well as the software that I used to use when I used to have Thin Ethernet as my main network, which wasn't as far back as you might think. We're actually talking like up until late 2007, I think it was. Yeah, I was a little bit slow to move off of it. It made things awkward towards the end. I've sort of wanted to mess with this stuff for a while, and a couple of people have asked me in the in the past few months, and I'm like, well, good. You know, now I've got an excuse. So I have an excuse. I've messed with it. I've filmed it. I'm not sure how well this is going to turn out, because it's kind of tricky to figure out how to film it and present it. We're going to look at how to connect it up and stuff. It's, uh, yeah, it's not really the same as hooking up a twisted PAR network, that's for certain. And I'll talk about some other technologies at the end briefly, because Ethernet wasn't the only one. Uh, if you're wondering what's happened to, you know, imply this and that about the K62 having a contemporary, well, that hasn't gone anywhere, and nothing... Well, something major has happened. I was all ready to go. I'd filmed a lot and I'd written a script. I'd recorded the, the audio. Uh, I'd recorded a bunch of stuff from the machine. But I had to make big compromises on the hardware. And all of a sudden, this piece of hardware became available to me. And figured I'd like to use the machine for a few weeks so I can write more accurately about it. It has a very important job, that machine. It regards synthesizers and such. So, well, we'll... I'll aim to get that done next month, May. I don't know when exactly, but that's when I'll try and get it done. I should have gotten a feel for it by then. As soon as I get this, this project done, I'm going to go straight on to just working with that thing non-stop. See how stable it is, how reliable it is, how good at its job it is, if anything needs to be tweaked, if there's any quacks. Shouldn't be anything I don't already know. It should be a known capacity, that machine, for reasons we'll understand when we see it. But in the meantime, yeah, thin Ethernet, let's get on with having a look at this stuff. Because uh, you don't really see it around now, and probably for good reasons, to be honest. Anyways, let's get on with it. So here is an older Ethernet adapter or network interface card for Ethernet because there were other standards. Ethernet isn't the only computer network that's ever been around. Now this card features three interfaces and whilst all three of them will be discussed in small detail, we're going to be focusing on this one, the BNC port which facilitates the use of thin Ethernet 10 base 2 networks. Before we move on though, let's briefly go over what the other sockets on the back of that card do. They are all Ethernet, they're just different types of Ethernet. So firstly, there's the RJ45 connector. This is for 10 base T Ethernet, named so because it operates at 10 megabits per second, it uses base band signalling, and unfortunately I don't fully understand the principles of base band and broadband signalling, so I'm not going to try and explain that to you because I'd probably do it wrong. You can look it up online or in books, I'm sure, if you have the mindset to take all of that in. You're probably familiar with this connector though, and how it works. There were some minor differences at the time this card was made, but that was more in the topology of the network and such. We'll cover them later on very quickly, and despite these, it will generally be compatible with today's hardware still. You could take a cable from this socket and plug it straight into your brand new switch, and it should usually work in some capacity. The second connector here is for an AUI, or Attachment Unit Interface. It's a 15-pin port. This moves the transceiver off of the card and into an external Medium Attachment Unit, or MAU. This could theoretically be any interface which that connected to, beyond that, any Ethernet bus. But because the transceivers for 10 base t twisted power and 10 base 2 BNC thin Ethernet were usually included on the card, the AUI would normally have been used for 10 base 5 thick Ethernet. And whilst I don't have any thick Ethernet hardware to show you, and likely never will, just because it's a real pain to work with, and it's not actually that easy to get hold of from what I can tell, 
Many of the same principles do apply to it as with 10 base 2. We'll cover some of the minor differences towards the end of the video, but yeah, the topology and the principles of it are, are very similar. Now, on to 10 base 2. It goes without saying, this is using a different cable to the type we would use today. It's an RG58 coaxial cable. Now, this isn't as easy to track down as you might think, because CCTV amateur radio systems seem to use the same connectors, but they're using 75 ohm RG59 cable, which means this dominates the market and a lot of people selling it don't differentiate. And whilst you might get away with RG59 on a very short segment, you really do need the 50 ohm RG58 cables instead. This hardware is pretty sensitive to things not being right. A segment refers to a section of network, and these can be made up to 180 meters long or thereabouts, and have 30 nodes installed on them. You could connect segments to other segments, but this is a whole world of pain and headaches. The hardware to do it isn't well documented or easy to find. Odds are you probably would use a server with multiple 10 base 2 interfaces if you wanted to do it today, but that comes with its own problems, not least of which that networks of the time wouldn't likely have used TCP IP protocols that much because they're quite heavy and you don't really want it on a network like this. IPX was far more popular and it's known as an unroutable protocol and well obviously routing that to another segment is uh, yeah I think you can put the pieces together as to why that's a problem. You could hook segments together with repeaters but yeah obviously you're gonna get a lot of traffic on the on the cables now so well, yeah, unfortunately I'm not really going to be able to demonstrate that to you. Still, 180 meters long, I hear you asking, and yes, that's right, all of the nerds have to share the same cable. 10 base 2 was referred to as cheaper net in some circles, and this is likely why, because it doesn't require the external MAU transceiver for each nerd like thick Ethernet would, and it doesn't require a hub or switch like Twisted Par, making it an ideal alternative for smaller networks of the time. Of course, you can probably see the issue here that with all those nodes sharing the cable, if you start connecting segments together, or if you use a protocol like TCP IP that has a lot of back and forth just to confirm that a packet has been sent properly, there's going to be a lot of traffic on that one wire. Nonetheless, we're going to build a short 10 base 2 segment here so you can get an idea of how it connects together and how it works. So, first things first, here is a nerd. A nerd is anything that connects to the network. It can be a computer, a, a printer, and I think there are even some gateways which could operate with 10 base 2 networks, which, I, yeah, that would have been fun. Anyway, our nerd here is a PC, and it will be the first nerd on the network. So we start by plugging in the cable. Right? Oh, wait, yeah, you can't just do that, because it'll bring the whole network down, before you've even started. You're going to need one of these. This is a T connector, and it splits the BNC connector into two. It's really nothing special. There's nothing in there other than a couple of pieces of copper to, well, make the connector actually contact at each end. These often came with Ethernet cards in years gone by, and they weren't just for decoration. You do need them. You're also going to need one of these. This is a 50 ohm terminator. Now make sure that it is 50 ohms because they are available with different impedances. It's another simple device. Inside is just a resistor which connects the inner core to the outer shield. If you don't put this on, the whole network will go down. Also, yes, I know what you're thinking and you totally can just make one of these with drawing pins, a resistor and a rubber band. I did that at work a few times. Uh, I don't recommend that because if the boss notices he tends to get pretty uh, irritated by it, considers it sloppy work, but they were cheaper than Terminators at the time because this technology was going out. We're not quite done yet. You now need to connect the chain from the Terminator to ground and usually you'll just screw it to the chassis of the nerd as this has the added benefit of preventing the Terminator going missing should it ever become disconnected for whatever reason, let's say maintenance or a disgruntled employee who wants to mess with you. But with that done, we can finally connect the cable to the remaining end of the T-connector. At the next node, we should bring that cable along, install the T-connector again, and then install that cable from the first node on one side of that T-connector. This cable must be a minimum of 50 centimeters in length, or the whole network will go down. Ah, well, 
it's a bit hard to get this cable in there. There's not really much room. I guess we can run a cable out to the splitter. Yeah, now you see, you can't do that either. The splitter has to be connected directly to the card or else the whole network will go down. Sorry, you're going to have to really think about how you're routing that cable ahead of time and you're going to have to fit it in on there somehow despite the mess it's inevitably going to make. It's just a limitation of this technology. Once it's connected up, throw another cable on that T connector and take it to your next nerd and repeat this process for every nerd on your segment until you reach the last one. At this end of the segment, we don't need to go any farther, so we put a terminator on the spare end of the BNC T connector because you do still need to use a T connector as we established with the fast nerd. But don't ground this terminator or the whole network will go down. Only one end of the bus should be terminated, or else you will create the potential for current to flow. This is called a ground loop, and anybody from average Joe to full-blown audio fool who's ever tried to get rid of that annoying buzzing in their speakers will tell you all about those. In fact, I bet you that if you perked around in most professional audio installations, they'd only be grounded at a single point, or the ground would only be connected at one end of a line. Thin Ethernet abides by the same rules. Oh yeah, and you'd better make sure you didn't forget to plug anything in, or else the whole network's gonna go down. I mean, it's worse than a prostitute's panties, this, isn't it? I'm starting to think it might not be the most resilient technology in the world. Now, this is something that does need to be emphasised. As someone who worked on this technology for a company which was slow to upgrade, I can tell you it wasn't fun if a problem started. There's a lot of stress on those T-connectors, and they can wear out if you rattle them enough over time. Also, disgruntled employees can disconnect things, usually terminators or other cables, if they get mad at working, and, well, it takes a whole network down, as we know. And if this happens, you have no way to know where the problem lies if it isn't visually obvious. A bad network card causing jabber or a bad T-connector will give you no indication of its problem, and as the whole segment stops working, it's not as simple as just finding one nerd that doesn't work, because none of the nerds are going to work until you fix the problem anyway. So have fun with the continuity testers and scopes, my shift's done, I'm going home. Why the hell is this stuff so sensitive? Well, it's a high-speed bus, it really is, it doesn't seem it today, which seems to play within the realm of, well, we can only just get away with this, and it requires a certain level of precision. Firstly, you're on a single cable, so communications are half duplex. You can only talk in one direction at a time, meaning good luck with that 10 megabits per second, you'll be lucky to see half of that. Also, if you're wondering how all the nerds talk to each other at the same time, well, the simple answer is that they just don't. Only one nerd can talk on the cable at a time. If another nerd tries, it causes a collision condition to be met, and it takes the whole segment down. Luckily, the transceivers can handle this, and the interruption will be very brief. It has to be, because collisions are going to happen all the time. Firstly, the transceiver will listen to the cable and see if it's quiet. If it is, then it will start sending data. If it isn't, it triggers a collision and it waits a random amount of time before trying again. Now you can probably see the issue here. Firstly, the bandwidth is shared on the cable, so the more nodes you have working on the wire, the slower communications will be. Secondly, the security is crap, because by the very nature of how the technology works, any nerd on the segment can hear any data that is on that segment, whether it was meant for that nerd or not. Now the nerd will usually ignore data that isn't meant for it, but well, it wouldn't be hard for somebody to start listening to it and getting your plain text passwords and other detail from the passing data. Thirdly, the collision condition can start stacking up, because every time it happens, the random weight of the participating transceivers will increase. It's like a highly annoying turn-based RPG. So, what's the deal with those terminators anyway? Well, if you take them off, you'll notice the collision light's going to come on constantly. You might get some data up the cable, but it's going to get slower and slower for the random weight interval stated above. And the reason is that the pulses on the wire will hit the end of the segment and bounce back creating spikes which the nerds don't like. The reason being that the spikes are caused by the nerd trying to talk on the wire, and in doing so, the logic on the transceiver does its job, believes that another nerd is talking on the bus already, 
triggering a collision condition and making the system wait. It will try again, but will instantly be met by the same collision condition at those ever-increasing wait intervals before it tries again. So even if you are getting data up the cable, it's going to slow down to barely a trickle in no time at all. If you've ever worked with SCSI buses, then yeah, this is the exact same principle, only in this case the speeds are lower and there's only one lane. In fact, the function of the Terminators gives you an opportunity to troll noobs who don't know much about the technology, or it did me anyway. To have fun, you just ask them a simple question. What is the logical length of this 10 base 2 segment? Now, I want you to try and work this out really quick, because you should know exactly how long my segment is from everything I've told you. You should be able to get the exact figure as to the logical length of my 10 base 2 segment. Now, if this was in an office, a noob would walk away, take out a tape measure. He'd probably report back with the combined length of all the cabling, which might be 4.5 metres in my case. But the length of the cable doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant, and they're, they're entirely wrong. In fact, they're a very, very long way wrong. Still, you managed to get rid of them for a few hours, so they didn't keep pestering you with inane questions. So, well, that's always a positive. The logical length of a properly wired 10 base 2 bus is infinity because the terminators prevent anything bouncing back from the end of the bus. So now there's no perceivable end to the bus at all and therefore it logically goes on forever. Yeah, the same applies to SCSI in most any other high speed bus. If it's got a terminator on it, the logical length is infinite. Now the way I like to think about the thin net bus in this regard is sort of like you're yelling down a corridor for a friend who's in another room. There'd be all rooms leading off the corridor and those would be like different nerds. But the thing is, if you yell down the corridor, it's not too bad. It's going to echo a little bit. So you're probably gonna to wanna to soundproof that corridor. But if somebody else yells from another room at the same time, well, I mean, your voice is bad enough. It's gonna echo back without the soundproofing. That would be the Terminator. So you're gonna be like, well, who's yelling back? You know, you're going to have to sit there and try and disarm that, which is something the Ethernet transceiver can't do. It just thinks another nerd's shouting back. And obviously, if someone else shouts at the same time, it's just comp you're not going to get anywhere. Nobody's going to be able to understand what the hell's going on. Of course, even with just one yell, every person in every room's going to be able to hear it on the length of the corridor. That's sort of how I see the this uh, 10 base 2 common bus. It's... Uh, not that secure and it, it has its flaws, most certainly, as we've established with the, the amount of things that can just knock the whole segment out. But, well, you know, needs must. It was a cheaper alternative because it didn't require costly hubs or switches. So, you know, you can see there were advantages at the time, not so much today. From the software side, you don't have to do anything special. You may have to set your cards to use this interface instead of AUI or Twisted Pair if it doesn't select it automatically. Uh, and don't turn full duplex on for obvious reasons. Or else the whole network will go down. You know, I'm definitely seeing a bit of a pattern here. How you change these settings varies by card. Some use software, some will use jumpers, some are completely automatic. Beyond that, you don't need to change anything. A Microsoft Windows network will function the same, only somewhat slower compared with Switch Twisted PAR networks we're used to using today. You probably won't ever see that 1.25 megabytes per second transfer speed, which these transceivers are theoretically capable of, and you lose more and more speed as additional nerds come online and start using the cable. Hey, it was good enough for Humberside Police until at least 2006, so it should be good enough for you. Still, running a Microsoft network wasn't particularly common in the time of this technology, even if you used DOS or Windows. People instead preferred to use other network operating systems, such as Novel Network. Network operating systems like Microsoft Land Manager were nowhere near as popular. In smaller organizations, another popular choice was Artisoft Lantastic. Hmm, Lantastic? Sounds fantastic. She called me Mr. Bombastic, and the fantastic of me on me box, she says I'm Mr. Rule. No, just no. 
This is the software I used to use and continued using well into 2007, which started to prove awkward towards the end. I was using version 5, which was for DOS only, but I got away with it for all that time, and it has some extra tricks that Microsoft Land Manager and Server Messaging Block cannot do. People like to call Server Message Block SMB or Samba today for some really strange reason. I'll just fuck off with the terrible songs already. The first of these tricks is that Lantastic can actually communicate with Microsoft networks, among others. You can even network with Apple, Unix, and OS2 machines. It allows you to sync time across different workstations, which was really useful for all the systems that didn't feature battery-backed real-time clocks, of which there were quite a few still in use. It offers sharing a files, drives, printers, other resources, as well as enhancing security versus Microsoft's implementation. So it is a fully featured network operating system, as it were. You, you're not really lacking anything in here. It, it does the things its competitors did. This is Lantastic 7 that I'm showing you here, and yes, it does also support Windows 95. To say up is probably a bit of a learning curve today if you're not used to this kind of thing, but once you've done it once it gets extremely easy, especially the Windows version. And you can see the interface does make sense, we can see the other machines both on the Lantastic network and the Microsoft network, and use the resources on them, so... Yeah, it's actually quite capable. The same goes for DOS, of course. The DOS version of the interface, well, it has these same features. It always surprises me that nobody ever mentions this software anymore. Nobody ever talks about Lantastic, because it wasn't really all that uncommon back then. Artisoft even offered their own network cards for a time, but at only 2 megabits per second, you may as well just get it running with a regular Ethernet card instead at 10 or maybe even 100 megabits per second if you want to be adventurous. People often shy away from networking DOS thinking about Microsoft's awkward as hell implementation. But if it's something you really want to do, then, well, you might as well try Lantastic because it is really useful and you can always just not execute the startnet batch file by default, save memory when you don't want the network running. Be warned though, you will need an NDIS driver for your network card and older versions of Lantastic expect Microsoft networks to use the NetBEUI protocol, which most people use TCP IP now. Anyway, I think that should cover that. That's showing you the hardware. It's giving you a quick glimpse into the software. I'm sorry, I'm not going to set novel netware up because it, it's quite a, a big task to do. And, well, if I were to do it, it would need its own video, but I think I'll leave that to somebody else. So I'm going to pass you back to that guy in the front of the camera now so he can rattle on about whatever he's got to rattle on about. Well, I think that's that about dealt with. Now, a couple of quick notes about Lantastic. If anyone wants to set that up themselves, well, uh, later versions require a different serial number for each machine or they won't work. Also, the network driver installation in the DOS version, you'll need an NDIS driver for your network card. And if it's not in the list, and it's an older version and it doesn't give you an option to specify your own drivers then just pick a card out of the list just pick a random Ethernet card because otherwise it won't put the lines in the configuration files uh, and yeah just pick one and modify it so that you know it uses the files for your Ethernet card the the endis driver that's provided for the card you're using and it really doesn't care what card you use there's nothing to stop you using like 100 meg or even 1000 meg Ethernet cards if there's a DOS NDIS driver or whatever OS you're running it on. Now, I should talk about some of the other network types. There are obviously other Ethernet types. Uh, firstly, there's obviously Twisted Power, which is what we still use today. Uh, and yeah, we, we know Twisted Power works, but it's particularly useful here because you might want to get 10 base 2 or some other Ethernet onto. Uh, twisted power network and probably the easiest way to do that now would be to use a hub now hubs are really neat because well they don't cost a lot of money for one thing you could probably find these on ebay for next to nothing if you work around some people ask silly prices if they got to make offer button make them a stupidly low offer because they, they might counter you with a better price or at the very least you've taken up some of their time for asking a stupid price in the first place 
but you can convert to different mediums with them. Some of them even have an AUI port on, which, you know, yeah, you could uh, interface that to ThickNet if you wanted. Uh, you'd obviously need a Vampire Tap, which I'll talk about ThickNet in a second. Nonetheless, uh, hubs have another use in that they actually work more like 10 base 2, even with Twisted Pie, in that it's almost, it's a start apology, yes, but it works more like a common bus, and the traffic's just replicated everywhere, as if they're all on the same cable. It's really neat if you want to sniff out some of your friends' packets when they're using your network, or something like that. They're pretty useful to have. And the thing with Twisted Pie is hubs were more common back then, because hubs aren't very smart, as we just discussed. You limit to half duplex, it's going to bounce the traffic absolutely everywhere. You wouldn't want to run a whole network on one, uh, not today. But at, at the time they were cheap, and in fact smaller implementations, you could use completely passive ones, which are just made out of diodes, very cheap, compared to a switch which has some logic inside. It tends to only send traffic where it needs to be, and they can run in full duplex mode, so potentially twice the speed. Uh, whether you actually get that really is debatable, but certainly would be a noticeable improvement for Twisted Par. So that's, that's a difference between Twisted Par then and now. It hasn't changed drastically, but the way people tended to install it was a little bit different. Uh, the last Ethernet type really worth talking about, there's loads of different Ethernet standards, but they just weren't popular, most of them. So the last one worth mentioning is ThickNet 10 base 5. Now 10 base 5 uses an RG8 cable, it's extremely thick. Now personally I never heard of it being referred to as frozen yellow garden hose, but uh, some pages on the internet, Wikipedia, I brushed up on that just to make sure I was stating the right cable type, refers to it as such, and it is an appropriate name because that cable's really thick and it's very hard to bend around corners. I only ever worked with that stuff once, I have no desire to do it ever again, at least not right now, <laughs> probably never will mess with that. Uh, the cable can be 500 meters long, you can have 100 nerds on it, so it's better than 10 base 2 in that regard, but whilst the topology and the limits of it are very similar, the transceiver is on the cable itself, the MAU actually taps into the cable, it literally bores into it is how you connect it, you have to break through the outer insulator on the cable, then there's an inner woven shield, then there's an inner insulator and finally a copper core and you have to get to the copper core without snapping it and never contacting the shield with that central pin although the MAU has to touch the shield in one place, you know, obviously on the outer edge it's quite an art form to it <coughs> now the other thing to bear in mind is that the cable has markings at 2.5 meter intervals you have to install the nodes at exactly that interval, and of course the nodes might not be there, so you're going to have these long AUI cables running out to the transceiver, and they're going to have a length limit on them. Really, really careful planning is required, because if they're not installed at that specific distance, the pulses, the waveforms on the cable could be in phase, and well, obviously it's going to take the network out. It sort of reminds me of John Guest's uh, Speedfit pipe in how it has the markings, bands or crosses. Uh, on John Guest it shows you where to cut it, and if that spot where you cut is, you know, lined up with the, the outside of the connector. If you cut down the centre of the cross and then plug it in a connector and it's got in properly, then it should just swallow half of the cross up to the centre. So it's a different purpose, but it actually reminds me of it. The, uh, the bends and the crosses show you where to tap into 10 base 5 cable. Awful technology, really. I, I'm not a fan of that stuff. I mean, obviously for its time, you know, what can you do? But it does raise an interesting point about 10 base 2, which is how the transceiver isn't actually on the cable, and I want to know how a nerd that's not running doesn't take the whole segment out. I suspect what's going on is it is literally just perking its way into the realm of we can only just get away with this because it's technically a split in the cable, is it not? If you look at the 3COM509, the trace that goes to the central pin of the BNC is this really awkward angle, just the straight line, straight to the transceiver. And I bet you it's literally right on the limit of what you can get away with. It's uh, quite novel. Ethernet wasn't your only option, there was Turk and Ring, which 
what do you know, use a ring topology. I think IBM had their hands in that. It has a very long, complex and murky history. There were some people, even when I was getting into computers at the end of the 1990s, who still swore by Turk and Ring versus Ethernet. And I think it did go up to 100 megabits per second, possibly faster. So, who knows? It might be worth uh, researching that in the future. I don't really have any desire to play with it myself, but I'm sure other people have, just by virtue of the fact IBM seem to have had their hands in that. They have a big following, so somebody somewhere must be running one. I haven't looked, but seems quite well documented comparatively. Now, the other notable technology would be ArcNet, which is an old technology. We're talking 1970s. It uses uh, coaxial cables, but it's like RG62 cable, uh, 93 ohms impedance. It's uh, not really the same as 10 base 2 at all. I don't know much about the signalling or anything, but you can only have two nodes, and then you have to put a repeater on it, it seems. Uh, yeah, but you can implement in a star topology. You can use some passive hubs. I don't. It's, it's a bit unclear where the limits are, and I've never worked with it. It looks quite interesting. It's uh, the, the thing is, it, it competed with Ethernet, and whilst you did need some extra stuff, I think it was kind of cost effective or some such at the time, but I really don't know much about it, so I don't want to go too far in depth. The maximum segment length for that is actually 610 meters, which is a number I very much like. That's a good number, I approve of that, whoever designed Arknet, yeah, 610 meters. I think that drops as you start sticking more stuff on it. Once you put like a passive uh, hub in there or something, it it limits the, the segment length quite significantly or some such, or how far you can go before you get to an active thing. I, it's, uh, yeah, I don't think I ever will work with that, but I'm actually curious now. I'd like to see an ArcNet implementation running, and it doesn't seem to be dead. I think they still use it in, like, embedded industrial systems somewhere, which to me says it's quite resilient. And the thing is, the interconnected star topology does somewhat seem to imply that a part of it could go down and not affect the rest of it. So it's probably a bit more error tolerant, a bit more fault tolerant, a little bit more resilient than 10 base 2. So it didn't seem like a bad technology for its time. But obviously you're not really going to run into it now. The word topology, I do keep mentioning that, and obviously I'll be showing the diagrams and yeah, there's there's a lot of them out there, man. Uh, you know, we could go really far with this, so if you want to start getting complicated, you've got like mesh topologies. Oh, well, hang on a second, let's just take some of those links out. Oh, hell yeah, finally. A good record for a change. You have like fully connected topologies, which are a complete headache. I don't want to work on something like that, man. That's uh, presumably an, an Ethernet implementation, but oh, good lord. And, hey, hold on a minute, what happens if we take some of those out? Oi fair, the guy you know shut it down. Still, I wouldn't worry about complicated topologies like that unless you're working in a nuclear power station or something. Probably not going to run into them. But I think that's it. I don't really have anything else to say. There are other things I could talk about, but you can probably find those on the internet. And really the purpose of this video was just to demonstrate and talk about 10 base 2. And I think I've done that enough. You know, we've seen it working, we know what it's capable of. We know a little bit about some of the software on it. Novel Network is, again, its own thing. There's no way I would have been able to fit enough into this video, and I don't think I'll ever do a video on that, because it's not something I've had much experience with, and I don't have much interest in it. To be honest, I don't really like computer networking all that much. It's my most despised field of computing, but I did want to mess with 10 base 2 again, just for old time's sake, because I used it for so long. Uh, my first network was 10 base 2 and it was pretty piss poor and not very reliable because it wasn't very well put together. It was with second end crap that I could find and my cables probably weren't the right type or anything but it got me through. Um, you know, that network stayed around for quite a while and I was still running a Lantastic network in 2007 which uh, I think I said it's a little bit difficult to uh, connect with things in, in the end, it had to go. 
I mean, it was a sad day when that had to go, but it had to go. It just wasn't wasn't cutting it anymore. Uh, but still, I'm definitely going to start using Lamtastic again because I can mount drives. It just it will make running Ghost so much easier than you know the way things are now. Where things, you know, I've got to attach another drive, which is no good if I want to work with laptops. And it's I don't want to have to do that if I can just put, put a network and connection there and map a drive and it's just so much easier that way. It really is. I don't know why nobody talks about Lantastic anymore because I forgot how how pretty usable it is. Once you get it set up, it's it's pretty good. And I've I'd honestly forgotten how decent it was. Like it's definitely worth another look. That, do, that doesn't deserve to get forgotten. It really doesn't. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I think that's about it. The K6 is contemporary, definitely looks like it's going to happen. I've been messing with it a little bit whilst making this video, and god damn, it seems to work. So, yeah, good start so far, good start. The hardware is all doing what it's supposed to do, it's giving me no trouble at all. I, I can't say much about it right now, but yeah. It's hard to say something anyway, because it's just doing what it's supposed to do. Everything I've asked it to do, it's just, oh sure, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do no fucking problem. So I'm really liking it. So hopefully we can get a video done on that next month. I just have to hope it doesn't like explode into a million pieces in the meantime. Also got some new hardware, some more old hardware. Not exactly running out of stuff to do here. I'd, I'd like to keep my promise that I made years ago and do some more console stuff. And I didn't do it for years because I just couldn't capture them. Well, now I can, uh, which I've proven on my other channel. I live, I live streamed uh, Zelda with a defective cartridge and I still beat it for the first time ever in my life. It was going back a couple of months now. I'd never beaten that game before. It, it turned out mine's broken. I think it's a bootleg or something, it doesn't work properly. I thought the game was crap all these years, I'm what's all this fuss about? But anyway, that's for another time. Uh, I'm wittering, and my first take of this outro was 40 minutes long, because I was tired, it was before I went to sleep yesterday, it was just... <laughs> I don't need to do that again. So, I'm a high treason, thanks for watching. Oh yeah, and I, I am going to do that making of the mullet man, mullet sure thing as well. That'll be a side video, it'll go up alongside probably the K6's contemporary thing. You can probably guess what that machine is, especially if you follow me around on Discord or whatever. You'll have heard me wittering about it no end. Everyone who's on there probably knows exactly what it is, I would think. But, anyways, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw up, load DOS 622 up. It gets worse every time, man, and I'm not going to stop doing it. No way, not now. I've invested. Well, I suppose there are a couple of things worth mention, uh, especially as we look at the broadcast monitor down there. Is I definitely do feel there's a TV-like influence about this old uh, networking stuff, like uh, 10 base 2 and such. You know, the cable's very similar. Uh, TVs use uh, a very similar cable. I think they use RG59. It's 75 ohm impedance. It is like the inner core with an outer shield. And, yeah, you've got words like transceiver and broadcast and things like that. It just really does make me think of television. Even the connectors do. But, uh, what do you know? The other thing to remember regarding complications and cost and such is, well, the humble floppy disk was still pretty viable back in those times. At least in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, you know, networks were expensive, they were complicated to set up, so a lot of people just made do. Just worth bearing that in mind, I suppose. I figured it was worth mentioning. You know, you'd just save everything to disk. In the early days, a lot of PCs didn't even have hard drives, so what was the point in having a network? You'd save it to a disk anyway. Just take the disk out, walk over to the other machine, load the file on there. No need for a network. Sneaker net is what you call that. That's what that network is. That's what that technology is. It's sneaker net.